Thank you, Chairman Doyle. The internet is one of the single greatest human innovations. It promotes free expression, connections, and community. It also fosters economic opportunity with trillions of dollars exchanged online every year. And one of the principal laws that paved the way for the internet to flourish is Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which of course passed as part of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And we enacted this section to give platforms the ability to moderate their sites to protect consumers without excessive risk of litigation. And to be clear, Section 230 has been an incredible success. But in the 20 years since Section 230 became law, the internet has become more complex and sophisticated. In 1996, the global internet reached only 36 million users, or less than 1% of the world's population. Only one in four Americans reported going online every day. Compare that to now, when nearly all of us are online almost every hour that we're not sleeping. Earlier this year, the internet passed 4.39 billion users worldwide. And here in the US, there are about 230 million smartphones that provide Americans instant access to online platforms. The internet has become a central part of our social, political, and economic fabric in a way that we couldn't have dreamed of when we passed the Telecommunications Act. And with that complexity and growth, we also have seen the darker side of the internet grow. Online radicalization has spread, leading to mass shootings in our schools, churches, and movie theaters. International terrorists are using the internet to groom recruits. Platforms have been used for the illegal sale of drugs, including those that spark the opioid epidemic. Foreign governments and fraudsters have pursued political disinformation campaigns using new technology like deep fakes designed to sow civil unrest and disrupt democratic elections. And there are constant attacks against women, people of color, and other minority groups. And perhaps most despicable of all is the growth in the horrendous sexual exploitation of children online. In 1998, there were 3,000 reports of material depicting the abuse of children online. Last year, 45 million photo and video reports were made. And while platforms are now better at detecting and removing this material, recent reporting shows that law enforcement officers are overwhelmed by the crisis. And these are all issues that we can't ignore, and tech companies need to step up with new tools to help address these serious problems. Each of these issues demonstrates how online content moderation has not stayed true to the values underlying Section 230 and has not kept pace with the increasing importance of the global internet. And there's no easy solution to keep this content off the internet. As policymakers, I'm sure we all have our ideas about how we might tackle the symptoms of poor content moderation online, while also protecting free speech. But we must seek to fully understand the breadth and depth of the internet today, how it's changed, and how it can be made better. And we have to be thoughtful, careful, and bipartisan in our approach. So it's, it's with that in mind that I was disappointed that Ambassador Lighthizer, the US Trade Representative, refused to testify today. The US has included language similar to Section 230 in the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement and the US-Japan Trade Agreement. Ranking Member Walden and I wrote to the ambassador in August raising concerns about why the USTR has included this language in trade deals as we debate them across the nation. And I was hoping to hear his perspective on why he believes that that was appropriate. Because including provisions in trade agreements that are controversial to both Democrats and Republicans is not the way to get support from Congress, obviously. So hopefully the ambassador will be more responsive to bipartisan requests in the future. Uh, and that, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back.